Um, I would like to uh, bring everybody out. Come on out. Now, you each have a, a name card out on the front here. Um, so we're bringing uh, Kahane Cooperman, who is the winner of 11 Emmys and two Peabody's. That's Kahane right there. And we have, um, she's also, uh, you may know her for 16 years. She was the executive producer of the John Stewart Show. And now she's the executive producer of the extraordinary uh, New Yorker Presents, which is now streaming on Amazon Prime. And I highly recommend that you check out all these amazing, different, varied, shorts, but all high quality <laughs> that are on there. Also uh, high quality Charlotte Cook, the creator of Field of Vision with Laura Poitras and AJ Schnack, which launched on September 29th. Shorts are uh, viewable there on The Intercept. And uh, we also have two filmmakers with us. Um, we have Janisha Bravo right here to my left, who shot the couple's first dinner party, Serve Six, for episode five of The New Yorker Presents. And she's had many other films at Sundance and, and South By, and she has one here uh, as well. And we have Garrett Bradley, who made her doc like for Field of Vision, um, and it's a short, and uh, she, and, and it's about Facebook likes. Uh, you'll see, you'll see a little clip from it uh, later. Now, I'm, I'm just gonna go around <laughs> and make sure that Cooperman and everybody are sitting where they're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know why I was insecure about that. Okay. So um, welcome all. Um, and one of the reasons that Janet wanted to put this together, and, and I think it's a great idea, is that the universe of shorts, it has always been about auditions for something else a lot of the time. And I think that there's been a shift. The internet is part of it. We're going to explore why things are changing in the world of shorts. And uh, these people are going to help us figure figure that out. So what I want each of you to do, we can start with Charlotte at the end, um, give us a short resume of how you first became involved with shorts. Um, so my background is largely festival programming. Um, and I was, I was just finishing the last hot docs when Laura kind of approached me. Um, to do this, and I'd nearly worked with Laura, which was on another film, and had said no, and had always regretted it, and I just thought, she doesn't ask twice. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of starting something from scratch, and really, um, her, her mission was to try and show that current affairs or journalism can be artistic and creative, which I believe in very strongly. Um, so the idea of trying to forge a new way of doing that was very appealing to me. So yeah, that's how it kind of worked out. Cool, um, how about you, Garrett? Um, well, I mean, I, the two features I had done prior to uh, the piece that was commissioned uh, with Field of Vision were, I guess, genre, you know, sort of ambiguous in terms of their genre. And I've always, in my work, had uh, kind of strong opinions about what genre means. And so it was really exciting to be able to work with, with Field of Vision, not just because they were had sort of this approach to what it means to make information films, you know, to make documentary and that they can still be artistic and beautiful and cinematic. That was hugely exciting. And then the idea of the size of it then being quite more concise and, and specific for me in the editing process was great. And, you know, so it, it's sort of a dream come true to be able to do that, honestly, and to have, you know, real borders that aren't yours. But how did you get involved with making shorts to begin with? Um, I mean, I think, I don't, I didn't really think I was making shorts. I think I was just making stuff that happened to be short sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. Kahane? Um, well, I started, I went to you know film school, and while I was in film school, I worked at Maisel's Films for Albert Maisel, so I had, it was very much documentary filmmaking, documentary storytelling, nonfiction storytelling was um, just what compelled me, and so, while I was in film school and working there, they, the Maisels let me use, um, sorry, their edit room at night and on weekends. So I made my own short documentary and I was fortunate enough to have it um, premiere at Sundance. And, and that was a real you know, doorway to many other things. And also, you know, ultimately I could trace back to that film almost everything that I've done since. But I loved um, that, uh, I loved that format, and I love documentary and nonfiction storytelling, and um, and went on to pursue that. But and it's really because of that that I was offered a job as a field producer on this new show, The Daily Show. <laughs> it was twelve a twelve week job, which I couldn't have been more excited about. Twelve weeks pay was an, enough motivation for me to 
moved from LA back to New York, um, which I did. And um, that 12 weeks, you know, turned into a huge part of my life. Um, and, but I always, and I loved it, and it was a fantastic um, thing to be a part of. But I missed um, the storytelling aspect of, that was part of myself and, and not so much in the show. Um, so uh, I started sort of uh, re-dipping back into that world. I was able to make one shorter film while I was there. It's, a, it's actually something I shot here in 1992. It's um, a behind the scenes of Dazed and Confused. Um, and I was able to finish it 10 years later. Um, uh, and then while I was there, I, I started another short film. So I never, that I just finished, but um, I sort of never, I was always tr straddling both worlds. And then um, I, you know, I, I was very fortunate to like literally get like a call from the filmmaker Alex Gibney. Um, the day after John Stewart announced that he was leaving, saying that I don't know what you you know what that means for you, but we have a rather extraordinary opportunity here, which was the New Yorker Presents, which you know for me, took could take my television production and my storytelling and filmmaking experience and sort of combine them in this, you know, great grand experiment. And so I, you know, went on some interviews and I was fortunate enough to get. That job. So that's she ran the gauntlet. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> They're lucky to have you. Um, how about you, Janita? Um, I went to theater school at NYU, and um, I arrived at short films by way of a play. I was uh, directing this production of uh, Strindberg's Miss Julie, and a cinematographer saw it, who is the DP I've worked with um, for the last five years, and he really loved the play and wanted to kind of figure out how we could work on something together. And I had written a short film, and and he read it and was like, "Okay, let's make this." And I was like, "How?" And uh, and then we did. We made it, and it was uh, five about five and a half years ago. It played at South by, and uh, and that was sort of like my introduction into this space and. One, thinking, oh, is this like a world of, that I could make a uh, life in? I'm not sure. But for me, I, you'd sort of mentioned before, like short films being a calling card. I hadn't really thought about it in that way. And also what Garrett said, like I never really thought of them as short films. To me, they felt like very full experiences. And I think that's maybe coming from theater. It would be like if you directed a one act, it wouldn't be like a tiny play. It would still be a play. <laughs> so I, while Time-wise, they're like not an hour. They feel very full to me. I mean, you know, it's like writing short stories or poems. They feel quite full. So yes, that is how I got into short films. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's follow up with you a little bit. Um, talk about. I loved your your short. Uh, the, the couple's uh, first dinner. <laughs> serve six, or the, if I've got that no, slightly yeah, right. right. And um, it's funny, it has, it's a narrative short, it has actors, and it is really um, deft, I have to say. Um, explain how you came about making that short. How did it work working uh, with, with them? How did you get together with each other? Um, Kahani mm -hmm. had sent me an email saying, hey, are you interested in this? And I said, <laughs> what, I could get paid to make a short film? Because I've been making a lot of money on short films for a long time, so I was like, yes. Um, I get paid, don't get too excited. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just this sort of, I mean, obviously The New Yorker is fantastic, and just, you know, like, that their signature was in the email. I was like, yes, I don't know what this is, but I'll just <laughs> do it, whatever you want. And, um, and then we sort of had this conversation of what this meant, and there was access to all of these pieces that had been in The New Yorker, and most of the work that they were doing was documentary, which is not my area. And um, so I'd been sent a handful of short stories. I picked one that I really loved, and then uh, my co a co-writer and I adapted it, um, this writer, Brian Savilson. And, um, and then we kind of just went into production. I mean, it was a pretty quick thing. We got a budget, we wrote the script, and uh, then we cast it, and then we shot it in one day, and edited. I mean, it was it was a pretty quick process, and unlike most of the stuff that I work on, there was actually 
more of like a skeleton behind it because yeah. there was there were also people saying that it needed to be handed in at a certain time. So <laughs> I uh, like actually <laughs> had to do things. Um, yeah. So yeah. I mean, there was that's one thing is like we have we're looking for these you know incredibly creative artistic visionary filmmakers to you know make these films, but it's like on a, on a TV pace and not with a ton of money. Like, yeah, we, gave, we could give you a budget, and it was like a most favored nation thing, so that like every person who made a comedic short, which you I did. I was making zero before, so was, this is great. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's like when I got paid for 12 <laughs> weeks at the Daily Show. Um, but so we did a most favored nation so that, you know, if you look at the New Yorker magazine, Shouts and Murmurs are their comedy humor pieces. So everyone who made a film for the New Yorker Presents got the same amount of money. And it's like, here you go, and you know, they had to report back to our line producer what they were, how they were using it, but it was like, that's what you got. So whatever your director's fee was, was some, worked it out in there. And you also, I mean, one other interesting thing, and this is part of the great collaboration, is that the, the stories we handed you, there was another one that you were. That I really wanted yeah, to do. There was another one that was um, as ambitious as the one that you ended up doing. One, This one involved like, I think, 40, extras and it was like 40 speaking parts and it was, 11 yeah. locations and and it, it was, was impossible to do <laughs> and uh, yeah, there were, it was one of two that we pursued but um in the end we didn't have the budget for like the number of people that that would have involved or the special effects that um this other one would have involved but the great thing about the new yorker and how we did this was that we we almost like curated pieces so my idea was like give a menu of stories to these filmmakers and let them like pick off the menu what makes them the most excited. Um, and so when that one didn't work out, you knew you had all these others to choose from. So it worked out great. So how did you pick that menu on the basis of what would be viable? Um, it was a real combination of stuff. There was, um, you know, looking at the New Yorker, we had to decide one, what's gonna translate visually. Like not every piece in the New Yorker can necessarily have a great Visual is be visualized in a really powerful way, um, but then we and also you know there were a lot of people in the mix on this, so we amassed um, a large number of different types of stories. I really wanted um, different voices, different perspectives, and different um, subject matter. So uh, once we sort of amassed that collection, I sent it to like the powers that be, and the powers that be are like. David Remnick and several of his editors at The New Yorker and Alex Gibney and several people at his production company and the Amazon executives and Condé Nast Entertainment and there was all these people weighing in. And for the most part, everyone, it was like, was incredibly trusting and wonderful and said, go for it, but you would find out in this process that like this story had already been optioned. Or, you know, this story had a legal problem when they were writing it and it might be best not to knock back on that door, that kind of thing. So some stuff fell by the wayside, but in, for the most part, they went with, um, you know, with um, what me and my colleagues were sort of curating and choosing for that menu. I've lost my voice, sorry. <laughs> so Garrett, how, how, did, how did you and Charlotte work together on Like? How did that happen? Um, well, Charlotte approached me, and I think it's so great to hear about the, the process behind how that worked with you guys, because I think it was so, it was somewhat similar, although, you know, the, the material is coming from the world. So the question was, like, what's, what's some stuff that's happening in the world that you don't think is really being spoken about a lot, that, that's not, that wasn't getting a, lot, a whole lot of press? Um, and so I kind of then went and got that, like, dream list together yeah. based on what I read in the paper on every day, you That's know? Really cool. Um, and then we just kind of talked about it, and I think that the, you know, for obvious reasons, like this story in particular, I think, um, I mean, I obviously want to hear what you think about it too, <laughs> but I think, you know, Facebook is such a part of our life, and um, I, in making the film, realized why this story was even more important than I think I initially had even thought. Um, you know, because when you Google, I read an article about click farms, and click farms were written about as being essentially sweatshops. Um, so when you pay to get likes uh, on a page, um, there were claims that, that you were then, in, in that process of outsourcing, you were supporting sweatshop labor and people working for very little money in bad conditions um, and clicking like over and over and over again to um, assist basically a, a Western economy. And then when we got there, uh, it was sort of like a total 
the opposite scenario, um, where in fact it was there was a lot of privilege associated with having that job um, in a, in a country that's really overpopulated and. People, there's a lot of pressure for people to go into engineering and being doctors, and you know there's only so many positions you can take. And then the other alternative is basically manual labor. Um, so being able to work for yourself and being able to work without a boss, you know, at home in in the comfort of your own house is very similar to you know web designers or something here in the states or in the west. Um, and it just kind of occurred to me that this was this was a much larger conversation about how you know big business essentially and maybe Facebook wanting us to pay them <laughs> instead of other people. It's really good. I highly recommend it. When is it actually going to be shown? Um, we're figuring that out right now. We, we roll very fast, so it's tr we, we also try and figure out like when is the right moment to put that conversation out into the world. Um, so we have, I mean, we have about 16 films in process right now, so I think we're launching the next season on the 22nd of March, so it'll be one of the weeks after that. So t explain the, the vision behind, excuse me, field of vision, <laughs> you know, the mission. What is your mission? I mean, I think our mission is really just to show different perspectives on current stories. Um, so all our films have to be topical to some level or be speaking to a larger conversation that's happening right now, but we're trying to show it from different angles and different perspectives. And what really drives us is what filmmakers feel, that they want to approach the subject in a certain way. Um, and with, with Garrett, we met, I think, two years ago at Copenhagen, and I yeah. watched her film and was really upset we hadn't had it for hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but Garrett's film is a real kind of mesh of fiction and non-fiction. I think maybe you didn't think it was as documentary as <laughs> I think it is. Um, so we just, I, when we were thinking of people we wanted to work with, I just wanted to see Garrett's take on a current story. And I think what you achieved is incredible, because not only is it visually different than maybe anyone else would have done, but you found a completely different story than we even thought. So that's kind of what we're looking for, is that really flipped or different approach to something. What's the uh, story on uh, asylum? Uh, what's, Laura Poitras has been doing this Julian Assange movie for a while, and, we, and at the New York Film Festival they showed a, a little bit of a work in progress, which got me very tantalized, I have to say, uh, and very curious about the status of it. Yeah, it's really exciting, actually. So we did, initially, Asylum was going to launch a field of vision, um, but because obviously things keep happening in his story, I mean, it just doesn't end. <laughs> <laughs> the Laura wanted to kind of take a pause, and she also did a huge show at the Whitney recently, so it was kind of like, let's see how this plays out a little bit. Um, and also, I mean, Laura has done short films for other outlets and really realized that it was a place where she could experiment. Because if you, you know, you're committing to a feature that's four years of your life or however long that takes, that you, if you're trying to do something stylistically, it, you have to commit to that style. Um, so she was, that was one of the reasons that we started doing shorts, but then also episodic really excites us because I think we're in a, you know, a new realm of where that can be, especially online. And so Asylum will be episodic, which is really exciting. And seeing her play with that and seeing how that works is really fun. So I think she just wanted a little bit extra time and also to see there was some big kind of legal stuff coming up, like the UN thing with Julian Assange recently. Um, so now we are getting to a point with that where it is going to be finished soon and it should be out in a few months, I imagine, or at least by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So you two are both working with a certain amount of, of volume, and it's also a matter of controlling uh, how, how you, you're out your product flow. It just seems sort of massive to me. Mm. Yeah. So, but you still have to give individual attention to the filmmakers and give them all their nurturing that they need. I, I'm amazed. All right. So uh, basically, <laughs> um, so uh, when you made. Um, these films, you were paid basically just a, enough to sort of make them. It's, it, it's not, it, it's more than you're used to making, but what is the real uh, potential for uh, making an income as, as a, sh a short filmmaker? And, and everyone can jump into this. I mean, because you two are doing something that is almost anomalous, <laughs> I think, <laughs> the, the producers, the two series that you're, yeah. that you're representing. I mean, you probably have to have a few other jobs, um, I think, and I think, I, yes. I think you do, yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel for me, and I, I don't know if Garrett feels this way, I think it's it's so, for me, it's, it's rare to just be given money to be creative, and it was such a great opportunity to have been given, you know, funding to make something that was gonna just be a further expression of like how I see the world. It's like really an exciting thing. So it was not, even if it had been zero, 
I would have said yes. And of course it was nice that it wasn't, but I think that it, I don't know how one would have a full career of just making short films. I mean, unless you were working for a place where like you were doling that out like factory style, but. So where have your other films been displayed and shown? For as, me, as opposed to festivals, but I mean, you know, how can people access them? Um, most of the short films I've made are online. Uh, they live on YouTube or YouTube. I don't <laughs> think that's where they live, actually. I'm like, do they live anywhere else? Nope, I think that's it. <laughs> they live on YouTube. Um, and I, for me, the kind of short films I made, YouTube is not necessarily the greatest space for them because like that that audience is like debatable, uh, but that's where they are and you can see them there. So even like Gregory, Gregory Go Boom is not. That's, I mean, no, it did it did super great. It, I, it's a short film that I made a few years ago. So what ago. is a super? What what kind of numbers are we talking about? Um, it has over a million hits online. Um, so that's good. I'm just saying like the people that write things. Like if you've been to YouTube and you read the comments, it's yeah. like. The, not like the highest brow of uh, <laughs> reviews. Um, and so it's like that kind of scene. But what are we talking about? My films are on YouTube. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I feel like it's the market has changed so much because when I was first making short films, they went to festival and then they kind of died and then they just lived at like a secret link on your website or you just put them online yourself and there didn't seem to really be an audience for them. But it feels like the tide has really shifted and there is more than YouTube. There's like Vimeo, there's Short of the Week, and I mean, I think Conde Nast even has something that they do that like showcases shorts. And Refinery29. Yeah, like yeah. there's, just seems to be a world of it, and then and Nowness also has shorts. One of my shorts is there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there seems to be more of an audience for it, so it's really exciting that there can be a life after festival for work that's, you know, under an hour. Um, but you're basically an artist who's commissioned to do things, and it's not a not-for-profit en enterprise, but your measurement of success is to get lots, lots and lots of people to see your work. Yeah, the more people see it, yeah. then it kind of leads to other work. I mean, I think I, that's yeah. how I sort of arrived at yeah. getting that opportunity was that I had a, short, I have a couple of short films that had done very well at festivals that have been written about, and so I think that that's how that came to me. And Charlotte, over over at, at Field of Vision, it's basic, and The Intercept, it's basically funded by Pierre Omidyar's First Look Media. Yeah. So you have a sponsor. Yeah, so we are fully funded, which is amazing. Um, so when um, Pierre Odimar founded The Intercept, it was uh, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, Jer Jeremy Scahill, and Laura. And Laura's deal was to do Field of Vision, um, and that came with a budget. Um, this year we're going to be making some revenue just because we wanted to increase what we were doing. So to do that we're going to um, try and generate a little bit of revenue. But really in terms of the production of the films, we are funded. And you give the all rights back to the filmmakers? Yeah. So the joy, the joy of doing this with two do, filmmakers. Do, do I sound incredulous No, it's great. When no, I it's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, like, I like it because people haven't I figured this stuff out yet. Shame. It's great. Um, the joy of building something with two filmmakers is they made it filmmaker friendly, and that was very much our goal. Uh, so we take zero rights to rushes or any of the films. We have a seven year license period, and that's what we pay for. Um, and then anything beyond that in terms of sales and distribution, we take 25% and the filmmakers take 75%. Oh, awesome. And on my show, Amazon completely owns the film. <laughs> <laughs> they own everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 But you can stream it. It's all available. It's all, I mean, they're, you're, you're parceling them out, sort of. Uh, how many have gone yeah, out Amazon, now? Yeah, um, Amazon chose an unusual, like, release strategy for this instead of, like, the normal streaming model of, like, a binge drop, I'm learning all the lingo, um, they decided to um, release two episodes a week. So actually this week, uh, our last two episodes of the season one are, today's Monday, right? Mm -hmm. So tomorrow, um, they're the last two of the 10 part um, season one. And um, I think they decided to do it for a couple of reasons. And one is like a nod to the magazine. You know, they wanted to, you know, you, if you're a New Yorker magazine reader, you kind of really look forward to it every week and you might ask like, what's gonna be on the cover? What's gonna be inside? What are they gonna, what are the issues going to be? And so I thought, I think they thought that like, it might be exciting to let people look forward to what's going to be on the New Yorker Presents this week. And, um, you know, we tried, um, to do a small nod to the cover, and so every episode, which has a beautiful graphic open, but the final image is different in every single 
episode. So the, the logo actually kind of like the Simpsons. Um, you never know what Bart's gonna write on the board and you never know how they're getting to that couch. Um, we have a, probably much less clever than the Simpsons, but um, different landing place for the logo in every single episode. And it's just like a, a very subtle nod to the It all cover. feels very That's custom very cool. designed. Each episode is different. Yeah, you know, even they're, very, they're different very different by, by design. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so back to the to the monetization question, um, Garrett. For you, how's how has it worked with your other uh, films that are not long? You know, I yeah right. I um I mean I um my parents are painters and I grew up around artists and so to be honest with you, I think sometimes you have money and sometimes you don't and you just keep making work, and that's really just how I've tried to do it and I um. You know, I haven't made tons of money doing what I do, but I couldn't not do it, you know? I mean, just to sort of echo, you know, what you were saying about, uh, I mean, even you have an opportunity, you just take the opportunity, especially when it's at the level that I, that I feel both, both are at, really. So where has, have your films been, been shown? Where can you look um, at them? I mean, it's, oh, well, Below Dreams premiered at Tribeca, and then it, it went all over the place. I, um, it's on IMDb. It's, uh, yeah, it's on Netflix and um, Cover Me, which we made for, I made for a biennial, um, Prospect 3, that happens, and Franklin Sermons was the head artistic director that year and um, was very supportive and, um, you know, but that is, that was made in an art realm, you know, so that went on to, actually, Below Dreams and Cover Me both played at the Hammer Museum last year. Um, so, I mean, it's a mixture of, like, art institution and then also film support, you know, I was at Rotterdam and... Um, you know, the New Orleans Film Festival in Montreal. I mean, the festival thing too, I think is, it's, it's important, but it's also, it can also be an insular experience. And I think um, ultimately, same with art institutions, you know? You know, I, I think it's funny what you say about like the audience on YouTube, <laughs> but. They're debatable. You know, it's yeah. debatable. What about Vimeo? And Vimeo, I, I actually audience, think. Maybe. Yeah, Vimeo I think is, um, is doing something really interesting. I mean, I remember, when Vimeo first came out, and it was like, this is a really high quality version of YouTube, because you could just upload stuff and, and maintain the integrity of your image, and that was really great, you know, as a, as a maker. Um, but I just, I agree, I think that at the end of the day, you really want people to be able to see the work, and if, if there are those out there who are in the, the position to support you financially to do that, um, and also shepherd you in a way that's, that's uh, actually improving your process, I think that that's invaluable. So are you at all interested in moving into longer form films? Um, I've only made, yeah, yeah, I mean, my first two films were features. So I think, and I'm working on an episodic series right now. And just, I mean, I don't know. I just, sometimes I don't even know what it's going to be, you know? And I just decide when, I, when it's time, you know? <laughs> I, I'm not saying that that's very practical. I'm not saying anyone else should go for that. It's, it's painful. <laughs> Um, I'm sure there's a better way of doing it. But then again, when it's commissioned, you're not, that's not how I work. You know, I was very much like, you know, you respect your, your timeline, you know, and um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it, it's, yeah. it's I, a... Like, I come from, I'm coming from like a slightly different place. I just completed my own short film separate from The New Yorker Presents, but because it's I was... It's playing at Tribeca, isn't it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think so. Um, but I had to, because I was working at The Daily Show and I'm, you know, I have um, a fam you know, kids and I had to, like, that sort of helped direct me towards not just making a short, because that could probably be all I had time to fit in, but I was dying to tell a story. It's actually when I came back from when I first met Charlotte as a juror at another film festival. Um, and, um, and so I needed kind of like, a story that had a beginning, a middle, and an end that I could see happening, you know, imagine. And so it almost like my limitations availability-wise for me dictated almost that I made a short. It was like I came at it from a practical place almost, even though, you know, it's, it's been a deeply meaningful experience. Uh, it, it still was like, um, if I had all, you know, a little more, I don't know, time to like expand it, like would I have done that story? I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
I had to make it work for me. Mm. I came yeah. at it from a, like a different place. So where, what, what, what will its life be after it shows at Tribeca? That's an awesome question. Um, <laughs> I would love to know. <laughs> um, I, it's, it has a little, you know, um, luckily at post Tribeca, there's a few more festivals that it's going to be in. And then, you know, you hope that someone's going to see it and, and potentially, it's a short film, so I don't really, I'm not expecting it anything theatrical. But you know, you would hope that like um, an entity like PBS or um, HBO or would, who does buy short films, absolutely Netflix, especially the docs, is starting side. to think about it. Um, who, you just start looking into all those places, and you hope that it's the kind of content that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then there's the whole sort of Oscar aspect of it, which is all about qualifying yeah. and and having that run go for. Okay. Absolutely. And yeah, we're in the process of figuring that out now. And we've also had um, a lot of meetings with the Emmys and they've just started a new category for Shorts Online, which is amazing. Fantastic. Um, and I think they've just realized that we're in a new era. And so there are so many more opportunities for people to get recognized for the work they're doing in short form. I mean, even Netflix have just started buying shorts, yeah. which is really amazing. So I think people are realizing that the audience is there for this stuff. Um, well, but people seem to think it's going to be something people want to watch on mobile devices yeah, and, and in iPads and you know it doesn't yeah. have to be yeah. we kind of buck that a little bit um, because I think there are so many different people are trying to figure out the formula for shorts online and I don't think there is a formula I think everybody's different I mean if you look at what the New Yorker are doing and what we're doing it's a very different experience than say what Al Jazeera Plus are doing mm -hmm. or um, and I think there's room for everybody or Fox, and ours are really or different exactly, from each other exactly um, and so we're trying to kind of force people a little bit to watch on a on at least like a computer screen or an iPad more than a phone but then we do think about that too so I think it's a difficult line to be like, can we make somebody watch this very kind of ethereal news film that's 15 minutes long on a phone? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So we're trying to figure that out as we go. Um, I mean, what is the future? And is VR one of those things that we're looking forward to? You've made a VR short. Yes. <laughs> How did that happen? Um, I got approached last year to make a virtual reality film by this company uh, named Weaver. Uh, they were looking for something narrative. Uh, a lot of, I don't know if people have done VR in the audience on the stage, but a lot of the stuff at that time, or most of the work that was available was um, experiential, and they wanted something that had an arc. And uh, when they had reached out to me, most of my stuff is uh, dark comedy. And I thought that it would not be enjoyable to hang out inside of a dark comedy. Well, not one of my own dark comedies anyways. And so we kind of went back and forth about it. And I just felt it wasn't the right thing for me. But yeah, my partner sort of uh, said to me, hey, how often are you being given money to make things? And you know, you have Final <laughs> Cut. I was like, oh my god, you're so right. So I ended up doing it. And it was great. And I did this. Uh, more dramatic piece that's a little political. Um, it's called Hard World for Small Things, and it's um, a day in the life of a, of a this community in South Central LA, and uh, a young man has a run with the cops and is um, killed. And uh, the premise for me, or the, the idea came from a cousin of mine who had been asphyxiated by the cops in the summer of 99 <clears throat> in Brooklyn in a case of mistaken identity, and uh, he was, I'm from Panama, he was on vacation from Panama and he didn't speak English and this thing happened and it was obviously very upsetting and I, as I was coming up with the idea for the VR piece, I was thinking about him and I looked him up because I wanted to see like what was online about this, it had happened so long ago and I hadn't looked it up, I mean I had never looked it up so I found two paragraphs, one was there were two pieces, one was in the Post and one was in the Daily News, and the piece in the Daily News I think was two paragraphs, and the piece in the Post was I think a paragraph, and in both the story had, it was just about like the events which were that he'd been asphyxiated, and one, I think the story in the, the article in the Daily News said that he'd uh, choked on a bag of cocaine, but his, the autopsy came up inconclusive. Anyways, it was just so terrible because I had known him for my whole life, and he had been more than these two paragraphs, and and there had not been who he was, you know, like his family, or that he was on vacation, or like what he wanted to be, and it was disturbing to me that you could live a full life and be deduced to one to two paragraphs that had nothing to do with the life that you'd lived. So I wrote this piece that was supposed to be like more than 
those two paragraphs about this man's life and that you got to spend time with him and meet his friends and his world and his sensibility and his humor. And that even though he was gonna die, he was gonna be more than that paragraph. <laughs> it was really upbeat, guys. But that's my <laughs> VR film. So uh, how was VR uh, an aspect of the aesthetic of, of the film? Well, we shot in 360. Uh, we shot um, on GoPros and um, yeah, it was just the, the world in which we made it was that. That was the format, um, as opposed to shooting a traditional film. And was that gratifying and satisfying <coughs> for you as a filmmaker? Did it, do you yes feel like it no. enhanced the film? Uh, yes and no. I think when I, I haven't actually seen it in its final. I, I saw like a version of it right before it was done. And I, I think I come from theater and in seeing it, I would, you know, the nice thing about making traditional films is that if there's an aspect of your work that it, it, you're not like getting it, you know, in the editing process, you can like build it or it becomes something else. You can shape it to be something else. And when you're shooting 360 degrees, it, you know, it kind of just is. And there's no, you can't like change it. You can't like shift the focus. It, it, everything is recorded because it's a circle. And so I feel there's the like, artist part of me that's like, I see how much, how it could be better or the things that yeah, I would have changed sure. that I don't have a control of. So that's a little frustrating. And if I had shot it as a traditional film, I think that I would have been able to um, sort of manipulate what I wanted from it a little bit more. That said, I think that what I meant for it to be, it is. And um, yeah, that's that. I actually saw it at Sundance, but I had no idea of the backstory. But when you say that you kind of wanted to honor the full life that your cousin had, um, I, you know, you achieved it because one thing I found about your film in VR was because I'm like, you know, I've got that VR. You look, you feel like you might <laughs> look a little silly doing it, but I'm like, you know, slack jaw. I'm like, mm -hmm, looking <laughs> everywhere. But it's a but, little embarrassing. But you are. It's so embarrassing. But you, it doesn't. You don't even give a crap because it's so cool when we've done well what you're experiencing so what you achieved in your film was that I honestly like was not sure if this was written or a documentary until the end I was like is this really happening on the street because you created real like a real environment all around that was going on and, and some stuff that didn't really have to do with directly with the interaction of the main characters but because I could look around you it helped add layers and layers to the life of each person because you saw the neighborhood they were living in. You got the sense of like just the how many people were on the street in that part time of day and you it was beautiful. So it's yeah. like such a like I it really stuck with me. I didn't get to see that much at Sundance this year, but I did see that and it really stuck with me. So you I think it can be really powerful and effective. So do you, do you, are you all interested in VR too? I mean, what, what, as, a, as a future medium for you? I mean, I think we've definitely talked about it. I think right now our goal is to try and get the work to as many people as possible, so we'd be less likely to do something that was location-based. Right. Um, although we did, um, we just showed a film called Concerned Student 1950 at True False this year, um, which is about the um, student protests at the University of Missouri. Um, and they actually also screened the film as an installation in the town to make sure it was accessible and their voices were kind of going out into the town themselves. And that way in an installation where we're, we're also having a, a companion film, I think we'd be really interested in. Um, but also, I mean, our sister site, The Intercept, have really started looking into interactive and how they're doing stuff. They have an incredible data artist called Josh Begley on staff who's just like tinkering around making this amazing stuff. Um, and they have a bunch of technologists on staff. So I think we're definitely open because we have that internal support to really trying different ways of putting these stories out. And yeah. AR is interesting too. Yeah. With the, uh, having the image there with something coming over it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I think just kind of you were mentioning just when we think about like the purpose of short films, I think that there's something to be said for, like with, with longer films where you have sort of like that beginning, middle, and end, right? There's this sort of like conclusionary element to the experience an audience has that I think can be problematic when you're dealing with real world subject matter or mm -hmm. subject matter that has the potential to create a call to action. And there's something about, you know, because then there's, there's not so much to do, right, if it ends. But with a short, with short form content, it's almost like experiencing moments that then a person is able to kind of have a relationship with emotionally because it's not finished. And I think VR 
I would love to explore with that because I think it's like a, it's more of a tool that breaks boundaries and that's a tool for compassion, mm. you know, a tool for, for ways to, to people uh, to feel a sense of um, connection to their subject matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm yeah. very interested in that, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we're going to open it up for questions. There is a mic, uh, so you should go over to the mic. It's right there, and it'll be recorded in uh, the whole thing. So do you have a question? Hello. There you go. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, and congratulations for leading a frontier of sharing shorts with people that don't end up at film festivals. I think that's really wonderful. Uh, my name is Russell, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm curious, uh, I guess I sort of have a media theory question about uh, the impact that sharing short form content, which often lives outside the boundaries of sort of calcified ideologies and film form that people might have more access to. Um, if a part of your mission statement uh, with New Yorker and with Field of Vision or as filmmakers, uh, how does that engage with um, exposing people to a different conversation of media literacy. Not just engaging with the paragraph that has all these mysteries of representation, but you're seeing between the lines that previously haven't been there, perhaps. Mm. Who wants to feel yeah, that? Yeah, I can, I mean, we've we found with kind of a general audience, we're really confusing people, and that's what we wanted to do. Um, we had a film called The Above recently by Kirsten Johnson, which was about this blimp that fl um, that's flying over Afghanistan, essentially surveilling Afghanistan. Um, and we also found there was another one in Maryland. And people didn't really realize what these things were. Um, and when we put the film up, we didn't really think it was that kind of formally challenging. It's a beautiful film. But the comments were like, this isn't a documentary. What the hell am I watching? And that was exactly the point. Um, and I think then, because the Maryland blimp got loose and became this na national story, and we somehow had just happened upon making the film about that, that it went out to all these other different people. And they just saw that maybe there was a different way of showing that. Um, but it is really, I mean, you make a really good point. It's really interesting. We did a f series called This Is Not A Coup, which is about the Greek financial crisis. Um, and seeing how people reacted that, to that was amazing. We actually put it out in Spanish and in English because the Spanish elections were coming up and they were about to face oh, a similar yeah. problem. Um, but the one thing about YouTube that's amazing is the community, if they're the right community, because a lot of people emailed us and said, can we translate this into Russian? Can we translate this into French? And they did it for us. Um, and that was just, I mean, amazing. We found that with other films. We didn't even realize, because YouTube doesn't alert you when people translate things for you, but we found that people were translating all of our films. Wow. Um, and so to have the community of viewers behind us saying, we want to share this with our country, has made us really rethink that, and we're gonna try and have way more subtitles in different versions, um, because it seems that people are desperate for, for this kind of content. What's the range of lengths that you would put up, and what dictates what the lengths will be? The story. I mean, I think the, the shortest we've had is maybe seven minutes, and then we have a film coming out in episodic that will be 70 minutes. Um, but we've said it can be anything from 30 seconds to like 100 minutes, but we'll make it episodic once it hits kind of 12 minutes. Um, we'll break it up. Yeah. yeah. Our range is like, I think the shortest thing is about 38 seconds up to about 15 minutes. Um, but, um, you know, I, I do think that um, there's something about the way we packaged our shorts for The New Yorker Presents, that when we were first sort of trying to tell people what it was, they were incredibly confused. <laughs> Not by the individual films themselves, but by the concept of sort of these different films being packaged together in some sort of cohesive way. And it was like... Without a host. Yeah, without mm -hmm. a host, mm -hmm. and we sort of like, originally found ourselves stumbling over ourselves to explain what it was going to be to people. The press, frankly, was like very challenging at the very beginning. They you have were, to see it. They, yeah, yeah they, they literally said like, I don't understand what this is. I'm <laughs> totally confused. Yeah. And Alex Gibney and I were kind of like, well, it's, ugh, you know. And, <laughs> and um, you know, I, I think once you do see it, you realize like how it all, even though every episode is completely different and every film within them, there a universe has been created that all of these exist in. And well, a lot of the pieces you you when they're doc pieces, you you actually use the writer as one of your sources for information, which sort of works. Those yeah, make a lot that of helps sense. Anchor. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
I, uh, you started to talk about length, and that was actually the question that I was going to ask. <laughs> but um, I'd like to take it a little bit deeper because I was wondering about, you know, just you hear a lot of gui misguided and well-intentioned advice about how long your short should be, especially if you want to get it into a film festival. And a lot of people say, well, it should never be more than 12 minutes or seven minutes or 10 minutes. And then you go to the film festivals and there's you know, many that are half hour long or 22 minutes long. So I was just wondering if you, know, just if you could comment a little bit more deeply about um, what you think um, is the liability of longer forms in, within the short film. I think the, the greatest liability is in, in not doing justice to your subject matter. Mm -hmm. Or, or not editing enough. So I think that like you should actually, you know, try to like not focus on the right length to get mm -hmm. it somewhere, and just look at your story and make sure you're just telling it in the most, you know, compelling, powerful, economic way possible. Because the last thing you want is for anyone to be um, bored or just distracted for a moment yeah. from what you're trying to tell them. Um, the short that I just finished is 24 minutes long, and while I was making it, I knew that it was going to be in like that territory. Mm -hmm. Someone who's married to a former film programmer <laughs> told me, oh, um, 25 minute films are the kiss of death. And I was just like, oh, really? Because mine's like in that territory, and I, you know, I kind of walked, walked out of the <laughs> room like with my head down. I was like, screw that. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I need to tell this particular story. And the fact of the matter is, is it, it has started being perfectly well received. And if it's a strong story, I think people will see that mm -hmm. and they're gonna work with it in that way. So I wouldn't box yourself yeah. in. I mean, I can speak to the festival part of that too. Um, at Hot Dogs, we would pair shorts with features. And so these 25 minutes were really tough because I mean, we were lucky in that we showed what we consider mid-length, so that would be anything from like 35 to an hour, and you need those, tw those 25 minutes in front to make up a whole program. Luckily, now we're in a different era where people are making shorter features too, so there is way more room for the 25-minute short. Um, and they actually play online really well. I mean, the, the research has shown people will invest in longer stuff online than people assumed. Um, but my advice on that would really be like, what do you want the film to do? Um, I mean, if you look at what Al Jazeera Plus are doing, which is amazing, they make one minute films and they make them so you can watch them without audio. Mm -hmm. And the idea is it comes through Facebook and you get that, you know, that hit of information. And I think you know, they are great and I watch them, but I also love watching a 40 minute short. Um, in terms of festivals, it's kind of like, where do you see it fitting? Because a three minute short will get you into more festivals because they can just get it in so much easier. Um, but it's, I, I think Kahani's right, it's just whatever suits the subject matter because now there is so, much, so many more options to you to be able to find a home for it. Go ahead. Uh, hey, my name's Calvin. Uh, this is kind of a question for all of you guys, but you touched on how there was a point in your career where short films actually started making a little bit of revenue for you guys. And my question really is, where does that revenue come from and does, do the short films make it back? Because they don't screen in theaters like you guys are talking about and it's sort of a corner of the industry that doesn't get a lot of light of how do short films make money back and how does that support filmmakers? So I don't how know How do short goes. films make their money back? I think one of the ways can be after, like if you made a film that has had some festival success, if it exists online, I think there are people who seem to make money on YouTube. I, I've not figured that out, but that seems to be a way that people make money with advertising. Um, I think that after your film has had uh, some festival, a festival life, there is a world in which people sometimes reach out to you to buy the films. I mean, they don't, in my case, they don't offer you nearly as much as they cost, but they, there is money to be made in a space where people will like have the film for a few years and, uh, and then you can sort of like pass, sell it to other people that will have it for a few years. But I have found that there's not a great deal to be made there, but it's sort of like you're using that to get your next thing, which can lead to more revenue. Mm -hmm. I, um, obviously the New Yorker Presents is something that was, we got our budget from Amazon, so that's how that happened. But with the short that I did outside of that, um, I did, I, I put my own money in initially because I knew I needed to create a trailer so that I could crowdfund. And so I put, a, I put a small amount of money, relatively small amount of money into that 
and then um, through Kickstarter, 100%, um, I had a successful campaign. So I was able to, while not pay myself, I paid myself back the money that I put in. So I, I was able to like, you know, break even before it's been at a festival, which is, I think like, I, I consider myself unbelievably mm -hmm. fortunate in that. Um, but uh, so that way, like, should I ever be fortunate enough to sell it, then I would consider like, oh, maybe I can pay myself a director's fee. And, and then, you know, I've, I've already arranged that if that ever happened, because you go into, sh you don't really go into making a short, I think, thinking that you're gonna make a profit. If I ever did then, because there's some organizations involved in my film that I wanna help support, like, you, you know, you maybe take some of that and give, give back some of that give some of it to them, but um, uh, there are ways to do it where you can break even, which, you know, you're, you're ahead of the game because you have this, you know, what is hopefully a, you know, a strong film to show for yourself. As I understand it, there are a number of uh, distributors who want to buy short films, but it's just for a very small amount of mm -hmm. money, and if you're interested in the kind of volume of, of getting it seen and gaining a profile and having it look successful in that sense as as you would on Vimeo or YouTube and mm -hmm. correct me if I'm if I'm wrong but yeah th that's the choice you're making one way mm -hmm. or the other because then those other outlets would take you make you take it off the yeah. uh, is that yeah I mean I yeah. think also the length is dependent if you're making what is say 40 minutes which is in Europe seen as a television hour because they put commercials in you actually can do co-productions and sell the film like HBO also look for films that length um, but we're also I mean what's been really interesting because obviously both of us are brand new is seeing the people who approached us about buying stuff I mean we didn't think the market was out there and I think five years ago it wasn't um, but people are really looking for content um, and a lot of big places who can't afford to produce themselves are actually looking to buy stuff so I think now is the time to try and try and do it. Thank you. Yeah, I, well, oh. I was just gonna say too, like you know, if you're if you're young and just starting off and doing shorter stuff and don't have access maybe to having someone commission a film, you know, like I just discovered uh, Torrent Bundle, which is a really interesting platform that people are just putting their work on, and you can sort of select what elements of it you would like people to be able to access and to get certain things in return for them, like an email, for instance, or, I mean, it, you kind of have to gauge how involved you want to be in that process. But I think, you know, when you're starting out too, exposure is super important and maybe don't worry so much right away about how am I going to make a return? And to that point, maybe don't make them that expensive, <laughs> you know, and just do what you can with what you have and make it as good as you can. Let's have one more question. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, I guess I wanted to ask a more bigger picture. Uh, it's cool that you guys are pioneers in this in this way of short filmmaking, but it's weird that in 2016 there's still a chance to be a pioneer when there's been so many short films made for so long. So I guess just why? Why isn't there a market there? What are the big obstacles historically and now? Is there a lack of demand or just a lack of creativity? Or what's stopping short films from hitting heights that feature films have in the past. I think it's just distribution options, yeah. to be honest. It's not I a mean, lack of creativity. Yeah, exactly. shorts used to always just be kind of seen as a calling card to try and fund your feature. Um, and even now, it's surprising how many people come up to me and say, like, oh, you've abandoned features. And I just don't see it in that way. It's so strange. I'm just like, <laughs> it's so much more fun to be able to fund something and then just put it out into the world ra rather than waiting a year as it does festivals and you hope for the best and, you know, seeing filmmakers go broke from doing festivals. Whereas now you're just going, like, here, world, here it is. Um, and there are so many different places. I mean, you mentioned Nowness. Nowness is amazing. Um, and it's just a great place for culture. And the, all the different platforms are trying to do something. They're trying to do different things. And I think that's all it was. It was people taking chances and realizing that audience, I mean, people always underestimate audiences. They think, oh, they don't want to watch it, but they always do, always. Thank you, guys, very much. <laughs> this was wonderful. Thank you, Anne. Yeah.